Hey folks, it's Tim, aka Turbo BB. I've got another flashlight review for you today, and I am covering the Olight M3X Triton. This is the updated version of the light that now features a XML2 LED, which is basically just a rung above the standard XML LED. This has two modes, um, two output modes, I should clarify, with a max of 1,000 lumens, and it could cast a beam out to 580 meters, runs a uh, max on low setting for five hours, impact resistance to two meters, and is waterproof with IPX8 rating. So it didn't arrive in this nice presentation case, as you can see here, um, pretty much, you know, a plastic case that was first featured on, if I'm not mistaken, their Olight uh, M20 series. So getting this open, it arrived with a um, nice decent sized holster. We also got here the instruction manual as well as a warranty card. And there were also two spare O-rings and an extension, which I'll get into a bit later. There was also a I guess a uh, battery carrier for the CR123 size light, so it prevents it from uh, rattling. But again, I'll get into this in a bit. Getting into the light itself, the M3X train was uh, always designed from the ground up as a thrower, right? I mean, no doubt, as you can see, um, this very nice deep reflector. Of course, now housing that XML2 LED in there, that's perfectly centered by that black um, centering disc. And as you can see, there is a very deep um, AR coating on the lens. Now, this crenellated bezel is made out of aluminum. It's not uh, stainless steel. It is removable, but um, I'm not going to do that now. I'll get into that in my review. And pretty much at the throat of light, there's just a few circular heat fins. Uh, the design overall hasn't really changed that much over the years, but it's, I guess you could say, more like uh, evolutionary steps versus a uh, revolutionary in this case. So um, as you can see, this still features the same uh, design motif here with these little square blocks that you could probably find on their uh, SR series as well. And there is this section here, which looks to be glued. Um, I actually wasn't able to twist that. I used quite a bit of force to try to get that open, but um, that would have allowed access to the LED, but I couldn't get to that. So, but at the throat here, the tube, just half of that, this is removable. And the reason is because basically this allows the uh, change of modes, which again, I'll dive into in the UI section, but covering the rest of the life itself, there is this clip here. Although it's a bit unwieldy because you know, it is a fairly large light. This is currently in a three CR123 size configuration. Uh, with the tube, you could run two 18650s or four CR123s. So I just feel like, especially with the bulk of this head and the the length, you know, if you clipped it to your pocket, it would kind of be a little just, I guess, awkward, right? Kind of sticking out like that. But um, for what it's worth, it, it is included. The light itself is sparsely uh, decorated. It's just pretty much the name of the light, um, the, a serial number, and as well as the Olight's uh, company name. Now, rounding out at the end is the tail cap. There is this design motif here that doesn't really contribute much in the way of grip, despite these uh, grooves here. So. Um, there are also these four tail cap guards, uh, but it, of course, it, while it does allow it to tail stand, because you know it is head heavy, it's not exactly the most stable. And one needs to be cognizant when turning on the light so that you don't jam your thumb uh, between the guards, at, and instead you place it into the recess there so that you can access the light. As I had previously mentioned before, the M3X can accommodate four cells as well as two 18650s via the use of a extension tube here. So again, as you can see, this end is not anodized as well, nor are the threads square cut. And because of that, I, I guess there is um, not the smoothness that I'm accustomed to on especially anodized thread, but of course that's apples to oranges, right? Uh, and again, of course, subjective. I was using two AW IMR 18490s, which is the equivalent of three CR123 size batteries. So now I'm gonna load up um, two Ready Last 3400s in here. And here's how it stacks up size-wise in comparison to the Corlan 7G5CS, the, um, here's the Olight, and Sunway Man's T40CS, as well as Shadow's TC500. So that gives you an idea of how it compares to other two 18650 size throwers. Now reflector depth-wise of the four, it sits somewhere between the 7G5CS, which is, has the deepest reflector, um, as well as the Shadow TC500 and 
T40CS that both have relatively the same um, depth of reflector. So this again sits somewhere in the middle. I'll get the exact measurements uh, later in my written review, but the outer diameter is uh, comparable to the other ones. It measures 62 millimeters in diameter, which translates to about uh, 2.44 inches. So about that battery tube, I like the fact that it actually had a stock bra on this end. So it does indicate to you that the positive should go this side and the negative should go that side. Not that I think it should matter because it's not like this acts as a physical reverse polarity battery protection uh, because of the spring in the head, but it's more of a, uh, I guess as you're shoving the batteries in, there's a nice stopper so they don't just you know push it in and just drop it all out. So it also is fairly snug, so it does require a bit of force um, to push, you know, I guess you gotta get a stick or something, push it in to get the batteries out or uh, pry this open a little bit. But as mentioned, it does keep it a little bit snug so it's nice and easy to mount in without the batteries falling all over the place. And here's a quick activation with the three cells in place. I do not measure any discernible difference running on three cells versus uh, two 18650s. These are three currently three AW LIFO 4s in here. Getting into the UI, I'm going to be very frank here and upfront in that I feel it's a bit outdated, especially you know after some of the recent lights that I've tested, like the Nightcore's P25 and as well as the TM26, which uses a side switch. Um, but I guess it's also more to the point that it does require the use of two hands in order to change the modes, right? So. There is a master on off switch. As soon as you click it on, the light will come on in high. I currently have this on a specific white balance um, that's cast for you know skin tone as well as uh, white underneath um, a fluorescent light. So that's why this beam here that you see is very blue. So ignore that. I'll get into the actual color in the beam profile section later. But getting back into the UI, a single click will turn on the light and to change mode, so you need to use two hands. You would twist to loosen the head and that brings it down to low mode and to get into strobe it's basically a tight, loosen tight to get into strobe mode. Exit is just a simple twist again out of it. So again, very straightforward but my personal subjective feeling about it is that I feel it's a kind of outdated. I would love to see them incorporate either a side switch or at least just a different interface, but um, because I, I guess it's inherent to the M series that they've stuck with this for so long that I guess it's almost like uh, the calling card of the M series. Plus, I guess another consideration is that when you do have this light um, rifle mounted for hunting, should you decide to change modes, I'd imagine it'd be a little awkward, right? So you would have the light mounted, and again, you would really have to pretty much bring um, your rifle down and twist the light in order to change the modes or whatnot. So um, as mentioned, it just feel overall in this day and age, it's a little bit of an awkward interface, but again, that's my personal opinion. Um, you may not agree with that. So let's leave that as just purely subjective. Now, another reason why I'm not fond of this is because when you do have the head loosened, um, I do notice that there is a very tiny little bit of play between the battery tube and the uh, throw of the light. As you can see, um, or likely here, um, there is, you know, again, some play, but that's, I guess, bordering on OCD territory. So it may bother some, it may not bother some others. So again, uh, take it for what it's worth. Now, one last detail about this configuration is that because it does rely on constant contact in order for it to um, switch modes, this end of the battery tube, well, actually both ends of the battery tube is not anodized, but this end specifically because it needs to maintain constant contact, right? How this basically works is that when you twist the tube all the way in, this negative path here is actually making contact with that inner circle there. Um, brass circle on the outer edge of the spring here, as you can see. And it basically completes that path to indicate, hey, I'm currently on high mode because this is twisted all the way in. When you loosen it, it basically disconnects that path, but yet the battery tube stays connected to, um, as you can see over here, it's non-anodized as well. So that thread path remains. So that indicates to the light that it is on low mode. And then as you tighten, loosen, tighten to activate the strobe, that basically sends a signal by either breaking or closing that connection there. While this isn't the first Olight product I've encountered, it is the first review of their product that I am conducting. My initial experience was again based on a M20 as well as a M21 that I had uh, purchased a while back. Um, and with the most recent experience when a forum member, RDR Fronty, sent me his uh, SR95 for testing. Oh, of course, 
you gotta remember Tiege, um he showed off his uh, modded SR95 as well. But in this particular case though, fit and finish wise, it's uh, outstanding. The the anodizing is completely flawless. And as can be seen in these close up here, there is no anodization missing around the sharp edges. Um, although this is properly deburred by sharp, I really mean like on the angles. Um, you know, it, it's just very, very flawless, very nicely finished and smooth. So there are none missing between these crevices and grooves here, and as well as in between these grooves here, which are again, typical problems that you may encounter with um, poor anodization finishing process. Now overall, it feels very solid, except for, as mentioned, when you, you know, loosen the head, there is that very, very slight gap and wobble. But I suppose that is par because you do need, um, uh, those threads can't be too tight, otherwise uh, this becomes very difficult to operate. Now the clip is nicely finished as well. The reason why I bring this out is because a lot of times these accessories are really thrown in as an afterthought. Um, but as you can see from this close-up shot, it really is nicely finished and does feel fairly sturdy enough. Again, I'll get into that in my written details, but to wrap up the light, the switch clicks on with a very nice uh, detent, very solid. There's no mushiness, um, no real play either. Maybe there's a little bit of a squeak coming from that switch there, but beyond that, you know, again, it just feels very solid. So to sum it up, it is a quality feeling, um, very, very well executed, and I feel it could stand up to some fairly um, hard usage. To give you an idea of the beam profile, as well as the comparison between the high and low outputs, uh, not necessarily real output to the eyes, but again, just the difference between high and low, I do have the camera currently uh, stuck in manual exposure. And of course, as you can see, the current light bez allows you to know if the light is on. Now, this purplish or bluish um, tint that you see on the outer edge here, that is visible to the eye, and I believe that is uh, caused by the heavy AR coating, um, as you noticed earlier in the designs and features section of the light. Now, as you can see, very close to the object, there is that donut hole, but basically, that's a very nice, uh, smooth transition, right? It's just a hot spot and a pure white pattern out here. There are no rings that I can discern beyond this uh, purplish outline here. But again, like I said, in real life, unless you're a white wall hunter, that really shouldn't be noticeable, especially uh, the further you get away from an object. So as you can see, pretty much by about a foot out, that donut hole does disappear. And it is just a very, very intense hot spot. And I'm gonna bring that back down a little bit. And this is uh, by comparison, low mode. Now here are some direct head-to-head uh, -head comparisons of the beam profile versus other lights. So on my left is the 7JU5CS, and on my right is the Olight M3X. And as you can see in this case, at roughly the same distance, the Olight M3X does have a much wider spill, but yet uh, about the same or if not a, a tad smidgen tighter hotspot. Now here it is compared to Shadow's TC500 on my left and the Olay M3X on the right. So overall spell is pretty much the same, but as you can see, the Shadow does have that ring there, as well as other rings that's not visible on the LCD, and of course the donut hole. And last but not least, versus Sunway Man's T40CS on the left, again Olay M3X on the right. As you can see, um, yes, those rings are a little bit visible, as well as the donut hole, because both it and the Shadow TZ500 have the shallowest reflectors out of these um, throwers that I just compared. Now, beam angle wise, as can be seen, it's a really tight hotspot. I would say that's close to about maybe 18 degrees, and the overall um, spill is roughly about 90 degrees or so. My initial conclusion is that this is a very solid release from Olight, um, although of course in this case it's really more of an upgrade to existing line. Now I did um, confirm the output on my PVC LMD of the XML2 that it is pumping out just a tick above a thousand lumens, um, and it does run pretty well regulated for the entire duration of the um, testing. 
Temperature wise, it didn't get too hot. Um, although I do feel that it does direct the heat path towards the head, which I do like. I, I never like it when a light's um, thermal path is heading towards the body or, you know, to, so as to impact the cells. And again, as mentioned, fit and finish wise, it is outstanding. The only one thing that I'm not thrilled about is the UI. But again, of course, that's personal preference. Um, you may or may not like it, but my personal taste is that I, I would like to see them update the Triton, perhaps as the, the next version with a either a side switch or just a different UI. Now, of course, I am cognizant that no review of a thrower is ever complete into um, you get it out for real world testing and I do plan on completing that. It's just unfortunately circumstances have not been kind to me in terms of picking out the right photographic equipment that I would um, need to get some really good footage of um, long distance throw. So hopefully whenever that does come in I will post a comparable review. But for now this concludes this review and as part of FTC disclosures the Olight M3X Trine was provided by BatteryJunction.com for review. Thanks again for watching.